Well, good morning again, and um, we're just glad you're here worshiping with us. Kamau, thanks for reading scripture. It's so good to see a young man holding the Bible instead of looking at the phone. So thank you for doing that. It made my heart. <laughs> um, but this morning we're going to come and we're gathering around the table of our Lord. Uh, communion is a time to worship the Lord and to for thankfulness and also for kind of an introspection. It's a good thing to look inside our hearts and we'll try to do that this morning. A few weeks ago, we had a service of believers baptism. We have a slide up there just about um, the people who were baptized. And um, if you can find that, it's on there somewhere. There it is, thank you. So that was just a few weeks ago. Remember that rain poured down. We had this window open to, to baptize people. And so those were a bunch of the people that were baptized. and. Um, Baptism and the Lord's Supper are ordinances of the church. What we mean by that is practices that we partake in. Something the Lord Jesus has left for us to do and reminded us to do it. And so baptism is very much like communion in that. Both baptism and the Lord's Supper are pictures of our salvation in Christ. They're a picture, baptism is a picture of dying with Christ and being raised to a new life. It's a picture that our sins are washed away. Communion or the Lord's table or uh, in some places it's called the Eucharist. They're all interchangeable terms. Is a beautiful reminder of the body and blood of our Lord that was shed for us and given for us. And he institutes the Lord's Supper by saying, this is my body and this is my blood. And I remind us, as I do often, that neither baptism nor the Lord's Supper are what we would term salvific, meaning they do not save us. It's our trust in Christ and our surrender to his plan and our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and his work on our behalf that rescues and saves us. Baptism and the Lord's Supper are wonderful pictures for believers of his work in us. And so when we celebrate in a few moments, we certainly will know his, there's a very real sense of his presence here. And um, we are taking time to pause and praise God for his mercy and grace and remembering his sacrifice on our behalf. And in essence, we're thanking him for our rescue, which is a good introduction, I think, to chapter two of Jonah where Jonah is thanking God, praying to God, and praising him for his rescue. So as we come to the table today, we're going to do the same thing. We're going to take some time to thank God for his rescue and take some time to be introspective, looking inside our hearts for what needs to be confessed and what needs to be made just we need to come clean on. And we'll, we'll take some time to talk about that because there's an interesting play in this uh, in chapter 2 of Jonah. But we can take that down and let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for who you are, for the fact that you love us with a love that will never let us go. I'm reminded of the, the account of Jonah, Lord, that there's no, there's no end you won't go to to get our attention. So, Lord, we pray that you would uh, help us to have ears to hear what you might have to say to us today, hearts that would respond to what you have for us. Lord, we all come here this morning with our stuff in tow. There's struggles we have. There's questions we have for you. There's, there's milestones and celebrations we've had in the in, the, in this past week, there's people who have lost some loved ones this week and have known some pain and a lot of questions. And Lord, we all come from different places, but we all come to pause before you and to worship you because you are God Almighty. So teach us and lead us from your precious word today. And we'll give you thanks for that. In your precious name we pray, amen. So we began last week looking at the account of Jonah. Jonah's a, uh, one of those small books in the Old Testament. Most Bibles, it's, it's two sides of one page and four chapters. I think it's 48 verses in total. It's not a long book. 
But Jonah is a prophet in the years 793 to 753 BC. He is told by God to go to the city of Nineveh. And as you know the story, he says, I don't think so. <laughs> He's told to go to preach to the Assyrians who for Jonah and his people were their arch enemies. They do not worship Yahweh, their, their, the, the God of the Israelites. The wickedness of the city was known to God. They are the bane of the ancient world, and they are a godless people. And Jonah decides that he's going to run in the opposite direction. Jonah is told to go to the city of Nineveh, which is 500 miles approximately northeast of where he is. And he goes down to the city of Joppa and gets on a boat for Tarshish, which is 2,000 miles in the opposite direction. He is running as far as he can. And of course, as we know from Scripture, it is impossible to run from God. And so he gets on this ship, and this fierce storm arises. The shipmates are so desperate that they're thrown over the cargo. They, they certainly are fearing for their lives. They know that this is not going to end well. Finally, they, they have to go down below and wake up Jonah, who's asleep. And they come to Jonah, and they, and they, they, they say, what's going on? And they cast lots, and who's responsible for this? It, it falls to Jonah. They say to him, who are you, and, and what have you done? And he says, he tells him, I follow the Lord God Almighty. And basically, he tells him, I'm running away from him. He says, I'm the problem. Throw me overboard. It's a dark place for a man to be in. They desperately try to row back to shore. They have no success. The situation gets even more dire, and they decide, we're, we're going to throw him overboard. They do. The sea grows calm. The men bow down and worship God and thank him for his deliverance. And we're told in the text that the Lord provides a great fish to swallow Jonah. God's provision is on display in this book. The Lord provides, he is Jehovah Jireh, and God provides here a fish for Jonah. And from inside the fish, Jonah, we have chapter 2. This is his prayer to God. This is a psalm. It follows the pattern of a psalm or a prayer of thanksgiving before God. And what we want to do this morning is look at the prayer and the thanksgiving that Jonah offers to God and the utter distress that he's in. That's one thing. And then we want to look at the tension that exists between this psalm of praise and really the state of Jonah's heart regarding the plan of God. And we'll look at that after we look at the first one. So he says, in my distress... I called to the Lord, verse 2, and he answered me. You know, you, know I, you and I can get into hard places in our lives, can't we? And I don't know about you, but when we get there, I, the only place to go is to the Lord. Where else can we go? And Jonah was in that place. Jonah hadn't prayed on the ship. The men in verse 6 of chapter 1 are, beg, are saying, pray to your God, and he doesn't do anything. But when he gets in this situation, he calls out to his God. So this is, uh, surely he's thinking, this is it. Let me reread verses um, 3 to 6a. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. The deep surrounds me. The seaweed is around my head. And this is a poem that has kind of a chiastic structure. It's that chiasm is in poetry, um, kind of this it reflects, it goes deeper and deeper, and then it mirrors that on the, on the way back. That's what this psalm is, is one of those psalms. And Jonah talks about getting deeper and deeper into his distress. Darkness and chaos are all around me. The lights had extinguished. He feels like he's in the realm of the dead. Hebrews believe that Sheol, the, the place of hell, was beneath the ocean floor. Many people believe that. And 
This is the horrifying minutes before life would certainly be snuffed out for him. He was in a dark place, and the darkness gets deeper as the, as the psalm goes on. And then he says, in, or we see in verse chapter 2 and verse 2, he says, I called to the Lord and he answered me. And then down in verse 6, the end of it, he says, um, but you, O Lord, brought my life up from the pit, O Lord, my God. You know, Jonah is in this dark place, and this, it, it, the, the storm was raging. So you, you, we've been in storms, and we know what it's like when a storm is raging. I've never been at a storm at sea. I can't even imagine what that's like. And so he's thrown overboard. And all of a sudden, he's been in a very dark place, and seaweed is wrapped around his head. But then all of a sudden, he... He's swallowed by this whale, and he's in this pocket of air. Something has changed. There's this reprieve at least. I have never been swallowed by a whale. Has anybody else? <laughs> we're, all, we're all in that same boat? Yeah. I have no idea what that's like. But I wonder, I was thinking this week, what does one, what does one feel? What, what do you touch? What do you smell? And all of a sudden you realize there's this pocket of air and, and you can breathe. I don't even, does he even know he's in the belly of the whale? The text doesn't tell us. So I don't know. But he's in this utter darkness and something has happened. And he is thanking God for the deliverance for this moment. He is reflecting on how dark his situation was, how desperate it was. It's li literally at 11.59, this is the rescue. The Grim Reaper is coming at midnight. And somehow he's rescued. And chapter, verse 7 says, When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, O Lord, and my prayer, my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Let's just finish that prayer. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. He's in this dark place. He's praising God for his deliverance, for his rescue. I want to focus for a moment on verse 8 because it's one of my favorite verses in this whole book. And it's one I encourage you to try to memorize. But he says this, those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. Another, another translation say walk away or leave the love of God that could be theirs. The same carries the same idea. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit. They're, they forfeit something and as I was reflecting on this verse this week, this is the most massive loss imaginable. They are forfeiting the grace of God that could be theirs, the love of God. This is a weighty verse. It's a somber verse. And it really reflects the rest of all of Scripture that talks about idols. You hear me mention them often. As I looked at it, I, I thought, is there something better in this entire world than the grace that's found in our Lord God, in our Lord Jesus? I don't care if you're the richest person who ever lived. I don't care if you're the best athlete ever, or you have the most incredible family or house, or you go on these lavish vacations, or you're an icon of health and fitness. Is there something in this life that compares to the grace and the goodness and the forgiveness and the peace of God? Because if there is, let me know, because I will chase after it with you. <laughs> this is a weighty forfeiting a weighty loss that Jonah is describing. When we cling to worthless idols, we forfeit the grace that could be ours. 
As I said, the topic of idolatry is all over Scripture. The opening commandments, you shall have no other God before me. You shall not make for yourself any idols. In the Old Testament, we have the Baals and the Ashtoreths and the Moloch's and the, the worship of the God of fertility and sexual promiscuity, and the list goes on in the New Testament. We have the worship of the Caesars and Artemis the Great in uh, the book of Ephesians and the worship of self and pride, long, long list. I'm not sure what Jonah had in view. Possibly it was uh, his shipmates who were praying to their gods who didn't answer. Or maybe it was his own stuff, his own pride and his own arrogance, his own uncaring attitude, his own agenda, his own comfort level. But the point of this verse is that every idol is worthless. That's the thrust of Scripture. You put that into 2023, every, runny, every one of us who run after money or success or pride or status or the next sexual conquest or and you name it will leave us empty. Not only empty, but this is reminding us that we forfeit the ultimate for the temporary. We forfeit the grace that could be ours. We miss the love of God when we run after stuff. Understand how deep and good that verse is. That's what our God is teaching us all throughout Scripture, that we can have no other gods before him, that he is to have the primacy in our lives. And it's mentioned over and over and over again in Scripture. You know why? Because we need it <laughs> over and over, because the, the tendency of the heart is to run after other idols. And I encourage you to take for chapter 2 and verse 8 and commit that to memory. We cling to the worthless idols. We are forfeiting something that could be ours. What a wonderful verse. That brings us to the second point I want to talk about this morning. That's the tension of this psalm. The tension is this. Jonah is thanking God in this psalm. He's thanking him for his awesome rescue and his deliverance. He is bowing down. He is worshiping God, thanking him. He knows this deliverance came from him. But he's still holding on to something. The rest of this book will lay out for us very clearly that Jonah is still unhappy with the call of God to go to Nineveh. I would say he has a bone to pick with God. He doesn't like the Assyrians. He doesn't think they're worthy of rescue. And so in chapter 1, we see there's this bit of repentance. It's me, throw me overboard. He's in a dark place. Then we see in chapter 2, thankfulness for his rescue. But then we see, in, as we go into the next chapters, there's still no surrender to the sovereign plan of God. He's still angry that God is sparing the Ninevites. And that's a tension in this book. I would say that's a tension in our lives. Before we get to holier than now with Jonah, <laughs> let's take a look inside our own hearts. How many times do we come here and worship the Lord on a Sunday and praise him, and then we have conversations during the week, you know, I'm really not, my son's marriage or my daughter's marriage is going down to pits, and I don't know what God's doing there, and I'm not really happy about that. We can sing praises to God here on a Sunday and, and then during the week have those conversations. Well, I have this illness. There's been no healing. And, and when we really drill down, we're not happy with God. We can say, I love the Lord. I read my Bible. I pray. And, and then we look at the cultural landscape and the political nonsense that's going on. And we say, what are you doing, God? And we question him and we, we question his goodness. You know what Jonah's saying here? He's saying, I don't like your plan, God. <laughs> this is a wonderful psalm in chapter 2 of a man with a con conflicted heart. And we do the same thing. We love the good stuff. We love the rescue of God. We love his favor. We love his provision. We love his mercy. For Jonah, the, God's rescue and favor was off the charts. <laughs> But then when things don't go our way in our lives, 
we tend to start to question him. I've been thinking a lot about that this week, and I know I do it in my own heart. We guise it and say, oh, I'm not sure what God's doing over here. I'm not sure. But, but when I drill down on that, I'm really saying, Lord, I don't trust you with this. I'm not surrendered to you with this. I'm not happy about what you're doing. And as we come to the table today, I'd ask us all to take a long, hard look into our own hearts, because that's a good thing to do. <clears throat> Scriptures tell us where to examine our hearts, where to see if there's any offensive way in us. And sometimes when we do that, we might find that we're at odds with what God's doing in our lives. We might find out, we, we think from our perspective, how God is working in our lives or how he's not working in our lives or not fast enough, and we may be like Jonah and be pouting and angry with God, that we're not okay with his purposes, we're not okay what he's doing. So there's that conflict. I look at Jonah with this conflict, and, you know, God's getting his attention. Did he get to this point when he's writing this by gentle persuasion? Not really. <laughs> he was thrown overboard, thought he was going to die, swallowed by a fish, and then vomited onto dry land. I love that word. It's not just God, he vomited him on the dry land. Jonah didn't even agree with the fish. God had gotten his attention. One of the questions we often get as pastors is, is it okay to be angry with God? It's a fair question. It is okay to be angry with God, but I will tell you another thing. You will lose that fight. People will often say, can I be angry at God? And my answer now is, yeah, well, try that. Let me know if it helps. Because <laughs> he wants us to surrender to his plan. That is such a hard thing. It's such a, that's why I talk about this tension in this chapter, because it's a tension in our lives, isn't it? We so desperately want our way. You might be there this morning. We can get there. We can be at odds with our God because he's not working fast enough or he's not working the way we want. He's not doing our bidding. As arrogant as that is when I think about it in my own life. What do you mean you're not doing what I want? Who are you? That's the God we serve. He's God Almighty. And so as we come to the table this morning, I, I just want to encourage you, on the one hand, let's take time to be thankful for his grace, for his rescue. Jonah was thankful for the rescue. Don't miss that. And you and I who know him, who trusted in him as Lord and Savior, thank you for his, we're thankful for his rescue, for his grace that is greater than all of our sin. But I also ask you to take some time to be a little introspective and... and to drill down in your own life. Because maybe we find out that we have a bone to pick with God in some area. We all have them. <laughs> Not quite working out the way th we want. And maybe we're not happy with God. And the call in our lives is always, always to surrender. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and his ways are grander and bigger and better than our ways, and we don't know the end from the beginning. But I know in my own life the call is surrender. That's where God was bringing Jonah. He was reminding him that he, has a better, he had a better plan for those Assyrians that Jonah didn't understand. He had a different plan. Jonah was fine to just let them rot. But God had a better and grander plan. That's the God we serve. So I just want to encourage us all as we, um, Barb's going to play a song in a moment after, after I pray and take a few moments just to, to thank God this morning. 
Here's what we're thanking him for, his body, which was broken for us. And I, use, I, always, I always lapse into the term broken. That's not the correct word when we come to the Lord's table. His body was given for us. Psalm 22 reminds us not one of his bones was broken. Remember the soldiers who come to the cross and they don't break the knees of Jesus? Scriptures tell us nothing in his body was broken. So when I use the word broken, I mean, it, it means he was given for us, but that's not technically the correct term to say broken. We break the bread, but the body of Christ was given for us. And then he says, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so his blood was shed so that you and I might be made whole. His body was given, his blood was shed on the cross for every one of us. So the table is for everyone who's trusting in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And you're, if you're a visitor here, you're welcome to this table. If you can't get up th this, this morning, there's some ushers in the back with some communion elements. Just slip your hand up. They'll get them. Make sure you get them. And, um, but just as this song starts to play, um, take a moment to pray, and then when you're ready, come up and get the elements and go back to your seat, and we'll all partake together. Father, thank you for this table that you've set for us for the reminder. And Lord, I know in my, in my own heart there's times I hold on to my own way and, and I'm like Jonah when I get not happy with what you're doing and I know that that always ends with me not winning because you want us to surrender to your plan and your way and your purposes. And so, God, give us the grace to do that this morning, and thank you for the privilege of coming around your table, Lord, because it's, it's so good to be here. In your precious name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Jesus all for sake come take It's a great old hymn uh, of the church, I Surrender All. Not an easy thing to do, is it, in our lives? To surrender every little aspect of our lives to Christ, but that's where he calls us to. And I think it's one of the things about the Lord's table. It brings us back to focus and refocus and say, Lord, I'm not really surrendered in this one area. Help me. Give me the strength to do that, just to truly surrender that to you to truly live for what you want for my life. Because we are all prone to wander and prone to walk away from the God we love, and we're prone to cling to worthless idols. And so he's forever calling us back. That's why so many good reasons why it's good to get together as the body of Christ, to remind one another of those things, to come back to center. And so we're celebrating, too. We're thanking God for his forgiveness and his rescue and his pardon in Christ. And as we take this bread, we do it in remembrance of him. In like manner, he took the cup. And we're also remembering that it's his blood that covers our sin. There's nothing else. There's no other way for us to be made right with God than the work of Christ that he did on the cross. His life, death, and resurrection are what we're trusting in, that Jesus did indeed pay it all, and he calls us to continue to surrender to him, and we do this in remembrance of him.